A mother's love. It is a seriously mysterious thing that has been studied by medical professionals and written about by some of the most famous authors for centuries. There are indeed a variety of psychological and physiological effects that motherhood can have on a woman, both positive and negative. From studies on postpartum depression and psychosis to documentation of women developing a sudden super strength to save their children from danger, it seems that motherhood can be a simultaneously terrifying and amazing thing. What happens then when a mother and her child seemingly vanish into the night and the child is discovered hours later deceased on the side of a well-trafficked highway, their mother nowhere to be found? Was this perhaps a last-ditch effort to save her child, or was the child sadly caught in the crossfire of terrible events that befell the pair on that evening? I'm John Lorden, and in this episode, we're going to be looking into the death of two-year-old Rashonda McGuire and the disappearance of her mother, Deitra McGuire, on November 2nd, 1988. Lake City is located in the northern part of Florida, known as the Gateway to Florida, due to its proximity to the intersection of two of the United States' major interstate highways, I-75 and I-10. Lake City boasts a particularly lengthy history, one that is sadly full of colonization and a fair amount of bloodshed, particularly of Native Americans. The city also played an integral part in the American Civil War, as the railroad between Lake City and Jacksonville was used frequently to send rations out to Confederate soldiers. Because of this, Lake City became the site of the only major battle to take place in the Civil War in Florida, the Battle of Olusti. However, when you look at pictures of modern-day Lake City, it seems like a rather nice place to visit if not to live. It's sunny, green, and just very typically Florida. Digging deeper, though, you would quickly discover that like any place, there are plenty of secrets buried deep beneath the surface. One such secret began on the evening of November 2nd, 1988, a little after 9 p.m. Aaron Stokes was going about his evening driving a truck, as he usually did along Interstate 10. As he was nearing the 303 mile marker, he came across a sight that he would never forget. The small, motionless body of an African-American girl lay in the westbound lane. He quickly called the authorities and presumably diverted traffic away from the girl as best he could until they arrived. The Florida Highway Patrol were the first on the scene, and they determined that the child had probably been thrown from a moving vehicle, then was struck by at least one more car. They also estimated the child to be approximately two years old a two-year-old, tossed from a moving car. It was a horrific thought that nobody wanted to believe. Quickly, the scene was turned over to the Columbia County Sheriff's Office, and baby Jane Doe, as she was known at that time, was sent to Lakeshore Hospital in Lake City. Despite multiple resuscitation efforts, the little girl was sadly pronounced deceased by 9.45 p.m. The medical examiner performed a full examination on the child and determined her cause of death to be a neck fracture. It was a terribly brutal fate for anyone, much less a toddler. The little girl was released to a local funeral home, but of course, investigators couldn't just leave her death at that. Now, it was up to them to figure out who baby Jane Doe was, where she had come from, and who had been so cruel, so callous, as to throw her from a moving vehicle on a busy highway. Fortunately for them, it took less than 24 hours for their questions to at least be partially answered. Dietra Ren Victoria McGuire was born on February 7, 1965, in Lake County, Florida, to Hayward and Nora McGuire. Dietra attended Columbia High School in Lake City in the early 1980s. During her junior year, she was a member of two school clubs that were very different from one another. Future Homemakers of America was a club that taught young women how to cook, clean, and raise children, and Future Business Leaders of America, which in its own words aimed to give its members the chance to gain a feeling of security before entering the world of business. This can perhaps give us a picture of the kind of person that Dietra was, driven to succeed both at home and in whatever career that she chose. The year prior, 
she had given birth to her first child, a daughter named Shamika. But Dietra didn't let that stop her from graduating high school in 1983. Looking at her senior yearbook photo, you can practically see joy radiating from her face. The father of Dietra's first child was a man named Fred Terry, who was three years older than Dietra and who had enlisted in the United States Army. From interviews with friends and family, the story of their relationship is a rather tumultuous one, peppered with rumors of domestic violence and infidelity. Despite this, it would seem that this on-again, off-again relationship would prove to be strong enough to produce one more child, little Rashonda McGuire, before eventually falling apart once more. If the timeline seems a bit convoluted and vague in this case, that's because it is. The only thing we really have to go off of, as far as Dietra's case, are the police records that were obtained from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement through a Freedom of Information Act request. And those don't necessarily paint the steadiest picture of Dietra's life. What we do know is that in November of 1988, Dietra was living with her then boyfriend, Alara Murphy, in the Gatorwood apartment complex in Lake City, and that several of her family members also lived nearby family members including Dietra's parents, Nora and Hayward McGuire. And according to police interviews, Dietra's eldest daughter was actually living with her grandparents at that time. We must remember that Dietra was an incredibly young mother when she had given birth to her first child, and it was likely that her family significantly contributed in helping to raise her children. To Nora, Dietra's mother, November 2nd, 1988 began just like any other day. Around 4 p.m., she went to pick up baby Rashonda from a nearby daycare facility, bringing her back to her home shortly thereafter. Around 6 p.m. that evening, Dietra came home from her job at the Nationwide Insurance Company in nearby Gainesville, and she and Alara picked up Rashonda and Shamika from her mother's home. This was the last time that Nora would see her daughter or her youngest granddaughter alive, and according to the statement that she gave police, Dietra seemed happy and unbothered. She stayed for a few minutes to chat and never mentioned needing to go anywhere that evening to her mother. Dietra simply loaded Rashonda and her older daughter Shamika into the vehicle, got into the passenger side of Alara's car, and they headed off in the direction of their apartment. To continue the timeline from this point, we have to refer to the interview that Alara Murphy gave. Alara stated that he and Dietra arrived home a little after 6.30 p.m. and that he settled himself down on the couch in the living room to watch some TV while Dietra was in the back room of the apartment. He told police that he assumed that Dietra had busied herself with undressing out of her work clothes, giving Rashonda a bath, and just generally cleaning up their back bedroom. Something that Alara doesn't include in his statement is that Shamika had gone home with them to retrieve some clothes from the apartment and that Dietra's sister Angela picked Shamika up sometime between 6.30 and 7 p.m. to take her to the county fair. In her statement, Angela notes that either Alara or Dietra answered the door and she observed that Alara looked as though he had been smoking marijuana. He said hello and went into the back bedroom. She told police that Dietra was in the middle of cooking dinner and that she had changed out of the dress she had been wearing earlier that day and into a pair of jeans and a gray shirt. Angela asked Dietra if she wanted to join them at the fair, and Dietra said no, she was tired and she planned on going to bed early. Angela also mentioned that while dinner was cooking, Dietra was giving Rashonda a bath. With that, Angela left to enjoy the fair with her daughter and Shamika. Back to Alara Murphy's statement. Around 7 p.m., he said that Dietra came from the back bedroom carrying Rashonda and that she didn't say anything before she left. She just simply walked out of the apartment. Alara considered asking her if he could go with her to wherever she was headed, but he decided to stay on the couch and watch TV. He nodded off to sleep on the couch and awoke around 10 p.m. to no sign of his girlfriend or the child that he had come to call his stepdaughter. Quote, I sat back down and hours went by, he told the police. He claimed that he didn't sleep for most of the night and that he kept staring at the clock as time passed. Around 2 a.m., he walked outside to look across the way and check to see if maybe Dietra was over at her parents' place, but he didn't see his vehicle over there. He went back into the apartment and laid down. Finally, at 5 a.m., he walked over to Dietra's parents' home and knocked on their door. 
Dietra's mother, Nora, answered. When he asked her if she had seen her daughter since they picked Rashonda up on the previous day, Nora told him that no, she hadn't. Although Alara had told the police that at this point he had begun to worry, in a statement given by Nora in 2002 when the case was being reinvestigated, she claimed that he didn't seem too upset and that he instead appeared to be clean and wide awake. Both of their statements do align on the next point, though, and that was that the two of them set off in a car together and went looking for Dietra. Alara and Nora drove around for approximately half an hour, looking at the parking lots of various motels and parks for any sign of the black Nissan Sentra that the pair had allegedly left in. According to Nora, neither of them said a word to one another as they drove through various areas of Lake City. When they returned to the Gatorwood Apartments, Nora asked Alara if he had called the police to report the pair missing. Alara replied that he hadn't, and that he was going to wait to see if they came back home before making that call. With that, Alara went back to his apartment and Nora got ready for work. It is worth noting that Alara mentions going back to Nora's apartment and watching TV until about noon when Dietra's sister Angela left for work. In her statement, Angela was unable to corroborate this detail, instead saying that he may have stopped by several times that morning, but she was unsure. Angela also states that she went to work at 3 p.m., not noon. We do have to point out that a lot of time had passed between these two interviews. Alara's interview took place back in 1988, and Angela's interview was in 2002. But it does make you wonder if these small discrepancies could be signs of something bigger. Nora worked until 3 p.m., but not without making several calls throughout the day to both her home and Nationwide Insurance, where Dietra worked. She was checking to see if anyone had heard from or seen her daughter. After work, she went over to her other daughter, Angela's job, and Angela told her about an article in the newspaper that she'd read regarding a child being discovered on the highway the night before. Nora went back to Dietra's apartment, where she found Elera speaking with a sheriff's deputy. He had finally reported them missing. At approximately 7 p.m., Sergeant Wells and Investigator Holland of the Columbia County Sheriff's Office knocked on the door of Nora and Hayward McGuire's apartment. After showing the McGuire's photographs of the child who had been found on Interstate 10, they were able to sadly confirm that the two-year-old was Rashonda McGuire and she was deceased. They theorized that Dietra had perhaps met with foul play on the night of November 2nd. Alara Murphy was at the McGuire's apartment during this realization, and according to Nora, he began yelling, Why them? Why not me? With the horrific news of Rashonda's death and the lingering question of Dietra's disappearance hanging in the air, Alara Murphy spent the night at the McGuire residence. According to Nora, he was picked up the next morning by a relative of his and called the house several times throughout the day. He even called that evening to inform them that the Nissan Sentra had been found, seemingly abandoned, at a truck stop off of I-75. When the vehicle was found, it was thoroughly examined by law enforcement. The seat covers were taken as evidence, as were the floor mats, and these items were listed as being saved for possible microanalysis. Whether this microanalysis was ever performed is not mentioned in the reports. The contents of the car are also pretty interesting. Two plastic Kmart bags with no receipts were found on the back passenger side floor, along with a single work glove. Dietra's purse was found on the back floor of the driver's side, and it still contained money, identification, and other miscellaneous items that belonged to Dietra. Strangely enough, a beige purse with nothing in it was also discovered in the center of the back seat. It's unknown who's, who this purse may have belonged to, and although the seat covers and floor mats are listed as being saved for microanalysis, the report isn't clear on what was done with either purse. They could be sitting in a box somewhere collecting dust on a shelf in some evidence room right now. The following day, November 5th was a Saturday, and on that day, Nora McGuire went over to Alara's apartment with her daughter, Kathy Davis. When they arrived, they discovered that Alara Murphy was in the middle of moving out. 
Nora also claimed in her statement that while she had seen an empty black trash bag in the home back on the 3rd, now that bag was nowhere to be seen. She also spotted a shovel and an axe with clay on them laying outside of the back door. Understandably, tensions were high between Alara and the McGuire family by this point. The day before Rashonda's funeral, Alara allegedly told Nora, I know you think I had something to do with this, but I didn't. Nora said that although nobody in the family had directly accused Alara of having anything to do with Dietra's disappearance or Rashonda's death, they suspected that he had played a part. Alara also allegedly told Nora that he had passed a polygraph test. This is particularly interesting, mainly because, according to further police reports, Alara Murphy did not pass a polygraph test that he was given in regards to Dietra and Rashonda. Of course, failing a polygraph doesn't necessarily make somebody guilty, but lying about passing one does seem somewhat suspicious. When the day of baby Rashonda's funeral arrived, Angela McGuire noted to police that Alara Murphy had drastically altered his appearance by shaving his head. In Nora's statement, she says that although Alara told the family that he would keep them updated if he heard anything about Dietra after Rashonda's funeral, they never heard from him again. That was 1988. And in 2002, the Columbia County Sheriff's Office briefly reopened Dietra's case hoping to conduct further interviews and possibly generate new leads. Unfortunately, they were unable to find anything substantial to lead them any closer to Dietra's whereabouts or the truth of what happened to her. It is worth noting that in interviews conducted at this time, several people recalled Dietra and Alara's relationship as being rocky, and there may have been even some debate surrounding whether Rashonda was the biological child of Fred Terry, Alara Murphy, or someone else entirely. These statements also focus on claims that Dietra was planning to leave Alara and that she was sick of his inability to hold down a job. While the many discrepancies within statements and Alara's behavior after Dietra's disappearance may raise several eyebrows, it's important to consider other possible motives and theories in this case. In 2002, when the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, or FDLE, reopened Dietra's case, they discovered that the day before she disappeared, a phone call was made from Nationwide Insurance, where Dietra worked, to her parents' home. Because Dietra and Alara didn't have their own phone number, they used the phone at her parents' residence frequently. But from there, the call was transferred to the VA hospital in Lake City. Who Dietra may have been trying to contact at the VA hospital? is unknown to this day, but it's mentioned in the police report that she had worked there in the past. And those are the known facts of the Dietra McGuire disappearance. And over 30 years later, it seems like Dietra's whereabouts and Rashonda's fate are slowly being added to the list of Columbia County's buried secrets. Minimal information can be found online about the case, with a Charlie Project page, a NamUs entry, and other web pages only giving a brief outline. The most in-depth research by far comes from the one person who submitted that Freedom of Information Act for the police records, an advocate by the name of Jason Fuch, who's from the Lake City area. Years ago, Jason learned about Dietra's case and saw a photograph of Rashonda, and he hasn't been able to get them out of his head ever since. He posted Dietra's story to several online forums, asked some really tough questions, and even featured her story on a podcast that he started called True Cold Case Files. Without Jason's efforts, the details of this case would be largely gone. So, what happened to Dietra McGuire? Obviously, the easiest finger to point would be at Alara Murphy, but that leaves a lot without explanation like Dietra's phone call to the VA hospital, the second purse discovered in the backseat of the Nissan, and of course, Rashonda's fate. If you have information on this case, please call the Columbia County Sheriff's Office at 386-758-1376. And if you live in the Lake City area of Florida, please keep an ear out. You never know when you might hear something seriously mysterious that helps break this case wide open.
If you're enjoying this show, please check out Seriously Mysterious, the podcast. We have over 150 episodes waiting for you.